All right, we are in record mode. Okay, I'm still accepting a few people, so pardon me if I uh, pause away, but we do want to uh, welcome everybody to this uh, conference call. Thank you for taking the time. Uh, Sally and I had been talking about this, and we had gotten together with our respective chiefs. Uh, I spoke over to the PD side, and we all had agreed it would be a nice opportunity to be able to have some time with you all to uh, let you know what it is we're doing in our departments, uh, to be able to address any concerns or questions that you may have, and essentially to give you uh, just a perspective on some of the things that we're doing for the city and what we're doing for the business community. And so certainly, and, I, and Chief uh, Camelli will go into detail here, but you know, there are things that we see that uh, on our end where we're still trying to make sure that our crews and us as individuals are still supporting our local businesses and doing our due diligence to help support you all as well. So for us, it, it didn't really come down to Chief Camelli, I apologize if I'm still your thunder here, but it was more of a thing of, you know, not necessarily what can you all donate, but what can we all do to help each other uh, make it through these tough times? And, and if that means, how, how do we assure that your business is still uh, running as smoothly as possible despite all this? We want to make sure we did that. But without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, introduce uh, Chief Mary Camelli with the Mesa Fire Medical Department and Chief Ken Cost with the Mesa Police Department. And Chief Camelli, if you would like to just start with uh, some words and then maybe give a, an update. Okay, thank you, Force. Hi, everybody, welcome. It's nice to have you on here. Uh, thanks for giving us this opportunity uh, for both Chief Costa and myself, just to kind of give you an update on where we are with public safety, what we've been doing, and then again, like Forrest mentioned, what we can do to help each other as we go through these weeks and months ahead, because we know this isn't going to stop. And when it does, I mean, we know it's not going to stop soon, but as we progressively go back to what the new normal is going to be, it's still going to be some time. So. Uh, for the fire department, uh, just some of the biggest issues that we face today and we've continued to face during this, the beginning of the crisis is our whole protective equipment, uh, making sure we have enough of it. We track that daily. We want to make sure that we're protected, the public is protected when we go into their homes as well. Uh, so we make sure that we have our gear on for both, to protect the public and to protect our members. This has been an ongoing thing for us. Uh, from day one is to make sure that protection is in place. In addition to that, we are monitoring our call volumes regularly so we can make sure we have enough resources available for the public when we respond to everybody in the community as well. So we're monitoring that actually three times a day. We get updates on our call volumes to see where we're, where we're at and what we need to do to um, add resources if needed in order to do that. We are monitoring the uh, the hospital overload, see where we are so patients aren't waiting a long time to be offloaded from ambulances when we are responding to them and transporting them to the ER. The hospitals have been very, very good. They have not been overcrowded yet at surge capacity. Everyone's been prepared in that regard to, month and then it's wrong. to beef up where they, uh, to add resources where they need to so they don't get at capacity. They have not been at capacity as of date. So we monitor that as well to make sure that when we do respond in the community that we get patients help as quickly as possible. Something we're just starting to work on now is to some antibody testing for our members too, to see who has been infected, who um, has already had the antibodies to it. So in essence, we're protecting the public as well. So we know which members of ours have already had the virus. Now there's still research out there saying if you've had it once doesn't mean, we're not convinced that it doesn't mean you can't absolutely get it again. They're still looking at all that. Well, we continue to look at all of these things uh, in terms of protecting our members and the public. So when we're responding to your family members and things like that, we make sure that we are protecting and have barriers between us and the patient as well. We've been also kind of partnering with the parks um, in all that they're doing in feeding and uh, doing restaurant buyout, all these kind of things to make sure that these businesses in Mesa with this money that the city got, uh, the city received, in order to help those in need and working with many of the nonprofits. So the parks is taking the bulk of it. Uh, we've partnered with some things. We're helping with some things behind the scenes in terms of getting equipment and supplies and things like that to help make this program successful. So these have been some things that we've been doing and uh, we continue to do as we're moving through each day with this and monitoring, we're monitoring daily uh, projections of where COVID's going and um, the numbers in the state and things like that so we know what to expect in the future. Although the projections still change, as real data comes in, the projections continue to, to change. And with the peak, the peak time of when we're gonna see the highest level in our state, uh, that has changed uh, about three or four times since the data started being uh, actually getting actual data. 
So the actual peak time was very close to, it was like May 2nd, but that can change again, depending on what kind of data they get. And as they start to, um, the social distancing, as they start to lighten up on some of this, we also anticipate some additional calls um, that, that may come of this as well. So these are things that we monitor daily um, for the community and for those respond on. You're on mute, Forrest. Forrest, you're still on mute. Thank you very much. Sorry about that, everybody. I think we'd have this down by now, right? <laughs> so uh, one thing I, uh, personally, I did not, uh, I forgot to mention is we have our assistant chief, James Johnson also, he's our operations, uh, oversees our operations and emergency operations center as well. Uh, now, Chief Cost, uh, would you like to go ahead and give us an update, sir? So, good morning, everybody. It's uh, for those who haven't met, then I'm meeting meeting virtually. Um, it's nice to meet you in a virtual standpoint. I see a lot of familiar faces. I have many solace here as well from the police department. So if I if I miss uh, anybody else in the police department that might be on page two or three of my screen, then forgive me. Um, as far as the police side, we we've completely uh, revamped a lot of the way we do business. Uh, obviously, from every everything to how we receive calls to how we're having officers uh, proceed out um, to, the, to the facts that we're asking people to come outside of their homes when we can, when it's not a safety issue, um, whether it's one of your businesses, we're asking people to, uh, to come out and talk to us out in the open air. Um, uh, PPE, which is the personal protective equipment has been a challenge for us, but thank goodness we have the partnership with uh, Chief Camelli and Fire, otherwise we would be in trouble like all the other um, uh, police departments around the country that are having issues with having enough uh, PPE, not to mention obviously the healthcare industry, which I know is represented in here today um, and, the, and those in that regard. This is a for, um, for the police department, our calls and the types of calls have changed. Uh, so we haven't really dipped uh, below a, a significant uh, uh, um, level of, of reported crimes. It's just different. So we are, we are lower in some categories and we're higher in others. Like for example, um, stolen cars and things that, be, that, that the cars being broken into at night. And then for your uh, edification for commercial burglaries and things that are usually in the middle of the night type of thing, we've seen some increase in some of those categories um, and, and have reacted to it. And our officers, have caught a lot of folks in progress um, of, of breaking into businesses and, and uh, people's cars and trying to steal cars at night. And that kind of goes hand in hand. Sometimes we see that spike in the summer when we have uh, more people at home, more kids at home. And uh, now we're, we're on an extended summer, if you will. So that, that wasn't a big shock to us. Um, a lot of folks feel like, you know, maybe some of the things like domestic violence would go up. Uh, we haven't seen that. But what we have seen is neighbor trouble, uh, fights amongst neighbors, fights in, 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 the, in, in the street, some tension starting to uh, overboil a little bit. So we're reacting to that um, and just adjusting our resources accordingly. So uh, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions as far as that goes. But with calls going down in a lot of other categories, we've redeployed our officers who might be more proactively patrolling the streets to when they're either writing their paper or uh, when they're, when they're uh, in their beats is to literally park in your business lots to try to, uh, to go and um, do extra patrol because we realize that uh, every business is not necessarily open, although obviously this week there's starting to be some relaxation on that. Um, but we wanna make sure that we're there and we're good partners to, uh, to every single one of you um, while your businesses are closed. And then we've seen now those commercial burglaries and things like that over the past several weeks start to really plummet uh, because of the officers' um, extra effort on, on making sure that their black and white police cars are, are being seen and then that they're being seen. So um, we have a, a lot of different things as far as the community goes. Uh, uh, Minnie and, and her team, Minnie works in our community engagement uh, division and um, they've had a lot of efforts working with uh, obviously nonprofits and with the city and with different businesses on uh, making sure that we stay connected even though we're, we're all basically sheltered in place and working uh, remotely for the most part. So I'll leave it at that and then answer any questions as it goes on for us. All right, thank you very much. Uh, 
Now, at this point, uh, if anybody has any questions, if you'd like to, now we have a, a great deal of screens, and so if anybody wants to go ahead and just give a, a quick uh, thumbs up there, we can go ahead and start uh, taking any of your questions. I'm gonna go through and scroll through the screens if anybody has anything. Hey Forrest, this is Mary. Yes, Chief. Um, can we have uh, Chief Johnson just give an update? He's Chief Johnson is managing the Emergency Operations Center, the EOC, uh, for the city, and uh, maybe he has some other information just to share with the uh, everybody as well. Excellent, thank you, Chief. Chief Johnson. Hello, everybody. Thanks for uh, being here. Um, I appreciate it. It's a good opportunity to be in front of you. Um, yeah, our Emergency Operations Center is up and running. Um, we've been up and running almost since the start. Uh, the initial uh, issues we had, much like Chief Cost and Chief Camelli said, were PPE issues and, and gaining all of that and wrapping our heads around all of the PPE needs. So um, that, was, that was a challenge for us. We've done that. Um, we have many uh, folks in there working uh, to keep the city. Um, uh, tracking of this uh, is a big deal. So we, we're tracking all of our employees. We've got code set up to where um, we're able to track the funding and what's being used for this so that any dollars that can come back into the city, we can get reimbursed for that um, is another thing there. Uh, we work regionally with our regional partners in the emergency management world and both IRMPD regionally as well. So we stay in touch. It's all about establishing relationships and we have great relationships with our neighboring departments. And so we just keep, a, keep a, ahead of any trends that start to develop and things like that. So, um, but anyways, just being in there in the EOC is, uh, is good. We also keep close contact with county and public health, which they have uh, the, the latest and greatest information working with the CDC. So we make sure that, that the city is following all those rules that they're passing down. And of course, from Governor Ducey and things like that. So working hard in that area, I appreciate, you know, everybody in the EOC and everybody in the fire department, the police department are all out there working hard to, to keep the community safe. And, and that's our, our number one goal right now. So if there's, as, as people have said, if there's anything we can do to assist, please reach out and, and let us know. Thank you. All right, Chief Johnson, thank you very much. Uh, I, there is a question that's here in the queue. And uh, the question is uh, about mental health calls for both police and fire. Uh, has there been an increase? And this uh, person knows that we have uh, COPA Health reached out in one instance and Commander Peters was a great help. So uh, it looks like PD uh, was able to uh, help out on this particular one. But uh, Chief Camelli, do you wanna address that? Sure, I'll be happy to start. Um, you know what, the, since our call volume is down right now, um, it's hard to say our calls for that has been increased, although we know that that's coming. We're, we're pretty much um, looking at the data and assuming that that's our next increase. And so we have a meeting actually this very week uh, to, we have a behavioral health unit. We had a partnership with CPR Behavioral Health here um, that we had to cease for a while based on the, so they wouldn't be ex unnecessarily exposed when this first broke out. But we, we have a meeting this week to kind of bring this back for the community, but we know that we're going to see a lot more of these type of behavioral health calls now that people have been quarantined for six weeks and that it's going to continue. So not only for the public, but also just watching, you know, offer just employees, general uh, city employees too, that um, this thing, this we're going to see this on the rise, people quarantined. So we are already anticipating, I have a meeting lined up this week to kind of bring back uh, this unit to kind of help with that, what we see, that what we anticipate seeing in the in the community on, in terms of behavioral health, that the, the, the call volume in this arena will be increased. Thank you, Chief. Chief Cost? Yeah, and, and for the police department, uh, we're actively tracking uh, mental health related calls, um, suicides uh, is a question I get an, an awful lot as well. And uh, we haven't seen uh, the spike that we were anticipating, and I, I think I'll double down on what Chief Camelli was saying is, um, you know, a lot of the calls that we go on, I, I described a little bit of the, uh, um, the, the, some of the violent crime as far as fighting and stuff like that that, that are going on, uh, whether we're uh, um, having a uh, uh, mental health component to that, uh, we haven't seen it. I also am getting updated later this afternoon on our latest number, so we can run off a ComStat model, 
on uh, our mental health related calls. And um, I, I'm really curious in this last uh, period on whether we did uh, spike or not. So the question is a good one. Um, what I can do, Sally, is once I get that information, I could forward that to you as far as our latest update, and then you can get it out to the chamber and the folks that are asking the question, that, that way they can get there. But we have not seen the spike that we actually thought we would. All right, Chief Goss, thank you very much. Uh, the next question, and this is just so, so typical of our group here, is uh, what can we do for our police and fire departments? Yeah. Chief Camelli? Sure, thank you, that's very kind. Um, you know what, what I'd say is just keep practicing, you know, everything that we're doing in the state in terms of social distancing and all of that, because that really adds up. And so all of us working together on this um, really plays a part and a key part in the, you know, in the flattening of this curve until we can get through this, this crisis. But if we can keep that curve flat by all of us still uh, doing, even when uh, we start to open up, uh, just make sure we have the distancing and make sure we practice those those uh, things that the, the governor's office is asking us to do in order to keep the spread down, just to kind of reduce the number of calls and the number of folks that are getting sick. But I think they're coming up with strategic ways to still allow um, the businesses to open up and still practice, you know, still applying these kind of uh, practices to keep the numbers at a lower level. So we don't get to the point where we run out of supplies and hospitals are at surge and we can't treat everybody with the same amount of care because there's not enough equipment if we don't if we keep it at a level that's manageable then everybody you know there'll be enough equipment and everything available for patients that end up in the hospital so that's all i ask is if all of us do a little part that kind of helps the whole community as a whole and and thank you for your continued support of public safety we truly appreciate it chief cost yeah you know for us we uh we really appreciate the offer and um there's there's definitely behavioral things that we can that we can hope to get from from the chamber is as we roll this out and Governor Ducey has his phase in plan. I know each of you will have your phase in plan if you're not in the middle of it already, and and really um, you know operating under the rules of the the uh, governor's order. We we have not and and we're proud of this. We have not had to arrest or cite anybody in the city of Mesa yet for completely going against the order, uh, whether it be the order from the city of Mesa that, that was the original order and then now the governor's order. So just helping us uh, keep everybody safe and distanced and, and while we phase back into the new normal, um, you know, we'll ask just that for that continued cooperation because our, our mission has been education. So if we go out to a business at 123 Main Street um, on a report and we get uh, you know, maybe about a dozen a day or more uh, reports where people are, are violating the order, then we go to the, either the business owner or the manager or whoever's in charge to just explain what the order means, ask for compliance, and then, um, and, and then we gain that compliance. We haven't had an issue since. So I think it's just that is working with us um, together as we get into this new norm because it's unprecedented and we've never had to do it. So we're in the same boat as everybody else. We're no different than any other organization. So just that type of cooperation. And then we will uh, continue to ask as the challenges come to uh, what we need. Obviously we're, um, you know, we're in the middle of, a, of, of exercises because of the, the financial hit and, and um, you know, whatever we can do to help out you, um, I think will be a, that vice versa type of, of ask down the road so we can kind of pool our resources together to help each other out. So. Um, I don't think I have all the answers of what exactly um, that would entail, but uh, I just know our working relationship has been so good with everybody that, um, you know, we'll definitely won't be shy to ask of what we can do and then vice versa. Thanks, Chief Cost. Uh, now we have another question here. It says, uh, we know that Mesa got something like $90 million for IT. Have your departments received special funds from that for cyber? If not, do you know when funding will become available for specific departments like yours? Chief Camelli? Sure, thank you. Uh, great question. So the city did receive $90 million, but it's for uh, anything co basically COVID related is my understanding. And so we are tracking all of the funding that we are spending related, anything related to COVID, whether it's 
you know, folks in the EOC that are helping and ordering supplies and logistics surrounding that, even with the food that the city's working on distributing to those in need that have lost jobs and things like that. Um, yes, yeah, so all of that is being tracked to be covered by the 90 million. Some of our supplies and all of that is also uh, somewhat being covered by FEMA. Anything that's related to COVID, we are tracking. So with the 90 million and with the FEMA dollars, that should help fund a lot of this additional dollars that have been spent based on the pandemic. So yes, the city is um, utilizing this across, across the departments in order to have us track the COVID-related um, activity that, that we're doing. Chief Cost? And, and specific to the IT related, it, it's so new that the money was just granted. Um, so I know that, that our IT director um, for the police department, um, along with a lot of our command staff members are putting together proposals that may or may not fit within that $90 million uh, award. And because there's guidance, there's, there's uh, obviously some rules that are attached to it, and, um, but it all is, is pandemic related. And so there's, there's some things technology wise, um, and I'd be premature to speak about it right now in this meeting that, that we could use, I think both in police and fire that would help uh, um, you know, uh, deal with pandemics and not only just this one, but any future. So we're, we're looking at a lot of those type of proposals and those staff proposals are, are due pretty quick uh, because it is, it is time sensitive. So I think here in a few weeks, we'd have some answers on, on what kind of technology we'd be looking um, to uh, leverage to help in these situations to answer your question. All right, thanks, Chief Goss. And, and there was a question before we get to yours, Kevin. Uh, it was a tailspin off this one is, uh, would it also, uh, let's see, if we've seen an uptick in cyber attacks against any of our individual departments, uh, Chief Goss, is that something you've seen over in PD or any attempts? I haven't been notified of any um, increase in the, in the potential cyber attacks. We're, we're secured pretty well, but I haven't, uh, uh, that hasn't been spoke about. We meet weekly with, uh, with our commanders and IT and that, uh, so we have not seen that. Thank you. And, and I think Chief Camelli and Chief Johnson, if you don't mind, I, I can answer on our behalf. Uh, we've seen something through the city via social media. There was some attempted uh, phishing through Facebook, but as far as our actual city is concerned, uh, IT has it pretty well locked down. Uh, they even have some things in place for us when it comes to remoting in and, and telecommuting and the such. So our city IT has been extremely active in helping secure and keep our system locked down. Uh, there is another question here, Kevin. Thank you for your, well, everybody, thank you for your question. Um, let's see, has there been any uniquely difficult cases with fire and medical or the police department, like a case that was made much more difficult because of the current COVID-19 pandemic? Chief Camelli? Sure, probably the, the most challenging thing for us is when we uh, go into assisted living places and we're, so we're working with them to bring patients like out just because walking through the hallways, we don't want to spread anything. And so we're trying to get, so we're working with these facilities to bring the patient out towards the front to keep this patient kind of confined so we don't infect other patients. So nursing homes, and the same thing as Chief Cross mentioned, when we go to homes and when there's known COVID patient, again, we ask if, if the patient's well enough to either come meet, meet us outside. If not, we absolutely go in, but if they can meet us out, just to limit the exposure because we know how easily this virus is, this, uh, this virus spreads. So we're working differently and, and responding differently to these types of calls. We bring a chair, we have a chair. So if they come outside, we have a chair they sit on. So they're not just standing up. So we, we've kind of changed our operation a bit on this COVID just to do whatever we can to reduce the number of people that get exposed every time we go on these patients. And assisted living is a little more difficult because that's where everybody lives and there's large numbers. But we do try and get them to a place where we can treat them in an area where uh, we're not going down the hallways and it's specific rooms, but to put them outside, either outside or in an open area, we can work on them as well. So it does change our dynamic a little bit in terms of exposure and we, we continue to modify that to meet the needs as we go on more and more patients with this uh, virus. Chief Cost, anything interesting, any unique challenges? Well, yeah, for us, every single call is so unpredictable. Um, so you know, where the officers um, are, are going on a call that seem to be, I guess there's never a routine call. Um, we, we have strict protocol in place for, for uh, the PPE, the protective equipment, um, but where they may be taking a report call and not have to, you know, they can keep distance. Uh, 
all of a sudden that could change in a heartbeat and then somebody is approaching the officer and they have to have physical contact. So just getting the, the right recipe um, in order for the officers to make sure they have the, 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 the proper protective gear on, um, on any call has been a bit of a challenge. And then um, one thing that's unique to the pandemic is the amount of suspects that are claiming to have COVID-19. Um, it's two pronged. Some of them have threatened uh, to either cough or spit on the officers. Um, and, and that you can see that happening nationwide. And uh, obviously um, that is taken serious whether there's a pandemic or not, but you know, that, that's, that's, a, that's a deadly threat uh, to the officers. So dealing with that has been a unique challenge to the police department and um, obviously those folks are going to jail um, but on the other end of things when they are going to jail or being booked they're they're trying to use COVID-19 as a reason why they can't go to jail because they're trying to you know kind of piggyback on some of the national narrative is hey you should be letting more people out of jail than than you're putting in because then you're affecting the jail population so they try to leverage um, leverage COVID-19 that way too. So those are things that our officers are dealing with as I'm speaking right now, I'm sure. Okay, uh, I do not have any other questions in the queue. Is there anybody who has anything that, uh, any more questions? Dave. Uh, quick, uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah? Okay. Um, I just want to give a quick thanks to Mesa PD, particularly their traffic division. You know, most of the time we see those guys in our rearview mirror rather than uh, helping us out. But uh, the traffic division has been absolutely amazing to work with as we've done our food distributions at the Mesa Convention Center. Um, they they help us in everything from logistics to the security of the lines and have put a, a very kind presence to our uh, uh our clientele that comes to that there a lot of people are really worried at that time but Mesa the officers have been pretty kind and and helped people in a way that they felt very comfortable I thought so uh, Chief Cost a big shout out to you guys uh, for the great work that you've done there uh, I think our needs gonna start to diminish I wanted to let this this group know what our numbers have been looking at they started at 500 people per uh, we we usually see 500 families per Friday, and that number quickly went to 1,200, then to 2,300. We remained about that level for five weeks in a row. Now we've seen a drop to 1,800 for the last two weeks. So that's a good trend. We like seeing it go that way. Um, but to meet uh, that need, because of the heat, we're gonna make some adjustments to our distribution. If you know people that, have, that need food assistance, we'll be distributing out of the Mesa Convention Center uh, during the summer on Wednesdays from noon to 7. That's a new time and date. We've never done that before. And then Fridays from 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. So extended hours on Fridays. We're trying to make it to where we don't have this big crush of people coming to the convention center during a three or four hour period. So we don't have to utilize the, uh, the police officers. We can help, you know, cut them loose to go help out uh, as, as things continue to evolve. Um, but please let people know those are times they can come. We'll have the same food to distribute during the entire distribution. So you don't need to come early. You don't get better stuff if you come early or late. Just uh, we want to, I guess, flatten the curve of people that show up for food assistance. So just want to let everybody know on this call, I know a lot of you interact with different agencies. So again, that's the Mesa Convention Center, Wednesday from noon to seven, starting this Wednesday and Friday from 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. Uh, that's this Friday. So we'll be doing that schedule uh, likely through the end of August right now is what the plan is. So uh, we'll continue to monitor how many folks show up. Um, I think we're getting, as the chief has said, you know, we're starting to see the, the economic part of this uh, turn on and the pandemic part of it start to wane a little bit. And so we know that there's going to be a lot of food assistance and other uh, mental health needs out there during this period is going to be equally as challenging. So United Food Bank's ready, and uh, we've been grateful for our nonprofit partners who have also stepped up. And the volunteers in Mesa, we've had a ton of people show up, have been very helpful to us. So uh, we're grateful for that. Uh, thank you very much for that, Dave. Appreciate it. Uh, I see there's a... Uh... 
want to make sure there's no other questions here in the queue before we. Okay, so uh, the question for you, Dave, here is uh, who do we contact if we would like to volunteer at the food bank? Uh, so uh, if you go, so Grace Bashara is, is uh, coordinates all of our volunteers. The easiest way to do it is to email her. Um, if you go to United Food Bank's website, uh, I'll put her um, I'll put her email in the chat box. But if you go to our website, there's a drop down menu for volunteer. Just click on that, and there's some options there, and you can uh, volunteer there. And I know United Food Bank isn't the only uh, group. We serve 63 Mesa agencies. Uh, we've been working with the Parks and Recs and Facilities Department to fan out a lot of their employees to our uh, member agencies as well to facilitate their food distributions. We've seen about a 20% increase in those agencies. So um, big shout out to Mesa Parks and Rec Department too for jumping right in. And, and we're trying to keep as many people busy as we can. And uh, like Mary was describing, using some of those COVID funds to, uh, I think we're gonna rent the entire convention center for the next three months. So if you, uh, if you wanna come down and help, uh, you can come down and help there too. So. Excellent. Thank you very much for that, uh, Dave. You know, um, let's see, I do not see any other questions in the queue here. If anybody, I'm going to scroll through the screens here right quick and see. Okay. You know, one of the things that uh, when Sally and myself and we've gotten together with the Chiefs, we wanted to uh, open those lines of communications because we know that everybody is having their own challenges. But what I like to do, and uh, Sally, we can talk more how we can continue to keep the conversation going. And if anybody has any ideas or suggestions, it could be a two-way street to see how we can support one another as we go through this. And of course, there is an expectation we might be going through this wave uh, again this fall. And if there's anything we can do to prepare for that, uh, we certainly can see how we can all work together as, as well. Uh, Sally, did you have anything else that you want to part with? I don't really have anything important other than to say how much we appreciate our partnership with both PD and Fire. Um, we know how hard everybody works and we appreciate the fact that, you know, our community is so supportive and wants to get involved. So, you know, keep that in mind because we do have people that want to step up and help. However that looks, you know, it, it kind of looks different for everybody involved. Um, looks like Norm might have something he wants to say. He's made himself large on my screen. <laughs> Mr. DeVay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, as many of you know, or some of you know, maybe not uh, many, but um, every year at COPA Health, which formerly is Mark Community Resources, we have an emergency preparedness conference that we usually put on in September. Last year, it was in August. And um, the reason it was in August, because it was in conjunction with the state, uh, the state and the national um, exercise called Crimson Contagion, which was um, planning for a pandemic. And so we had a fantastic conference last year planning for a pandemic. And we're we're going to be doing a follow-up conference this year um, with uh, resilience during a pandemic, pandemic and after a pandemic. So anybody that's interested, we're, we're looking for stories, things that work, things that really helped you uh, get through this or are helping you get through this. And I just uh, am reaching out because we usually have a couple hundred people attend this. It's always been very successful. Um, Forrest, I know uh, if you remember Mary, uh, in the past um, when we've had active shooter uh, conferences and um, other emergencies, I know you've taken part, but uh, please keep in mind that if you have something that's really working, it's something that uh, you think you'd like to share, um, whether it's uh, as part of a, a panel or uh, uh, you know, a white paper, something that you wanna share, um, let us know, because we're really work, working to try to focus on, obviously uh, the developmentally delayed populations, mental health, um, seniors and children. That's what we uh, try to do every year. So please, um, you know, contact me. And I think Sally knows how to get a hold of me. Uh, most people do. If you have uh, something you want to take part in that or you want to share something during that conference in um, August or September. It's kind of weird to be thinking about evaluating while we're still in it, but uh, it's something we have to think about ahead of time. Right, right. Thanks, Norm. Thank you, Norm. Thank you. Uh, Chief Camelli, do you have any parting uh, comments? No, I just want to kind of um, 
match what Sally had just said. I, I appreciate the partnership too with the chamber and the businesses. Uh, you know, when we go through these things, working together makes it much easier for everybody. And uh, thank you so much for your ongoing support for public safety. And we'll continue to serve the community out there, but uh, we couldn't do it without the support that we received. So just to say, I, I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chief. Thank you, Chief. Chief Cos? Uh, just the same. I mean, I feel so fortunate to have grown up in this organization and be with the city of Mesa and uh, everybody here. I mean, it's not just a uh, cliche. Uh, it, it's truly an outstanding community. And, and uh, in times of crisis, you see, you know, what, what folks are made of. And I think we're seeing that right now. So I look forward to working with each and every one of you uh, moving forward. So if you ever need anything, don't hesitate. Okay. Well, again, thank you all of you for your support. And I'll be getting together with Sally. Uh, we'll have this uh, audio obviously available in this video. And uh, as we go along uh, this next few weeks, we'll uh, find a way where we can open up some channels communications as to some partnership opportunities. Uh, as things uh, go along here, we may see an opportunity for us to collaborate one way or another with your organization or with the Chamber of Commerce. But with that, uh, I wanna thank you very much for taking your time and thank you again for for all of your support. Thank you, everyone. Have yeah. a great okay. day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank Bye. You. Thanks, Chief.